Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the third in our series of tutorials on French literature with former Latimer head Peter Winter. Under the spotlight tonight is Moliere's play Le Misanthrope. Peter will be giving us an insight into the language of this 17th century satire and a deeper understanding of the dark subtleties of French humour. For those of you who are new to these tutorials, and I know some of you are, the session falls roughly into three parts. <clears throat> First, Peter will give us some context around the playwright and his work. Then he'll explore in more detail the language from some of the play's key passages. In the final section of the tutorial, we'll open the floor to discussion, share observations, and Peter will answer any questions you may have. Please do join in with this part of the evening. It's great fun. And if you'd rather not ask a question yourself, you can type it into the chat facility and I'll read it out on your behalf. My only plea is that it's not in French. Believe you me, you don't want to hear me stumbling through any bon mots. One more plea is that you keep your microphones off until we start the discussion so that we can all hear Peter clearly. Just before we make a start, I wanted to thank our speaker and you, the audience, for supporting this evening's talk. The donations we've received so far for Peter's four-part series has raised a total of £2,600, all of which will go to our annual bursaries of Peel. So on behalf of the school, thank you so much for helping us in our campaign to give bright children without the financial means, a Latimer education. So without further ado, Peter, over to you. Thank you, Sean, very much indeed. And good evening to everyone or good morning if you're in California. Um, Jamie, you can stop watching the football now and concentrate please in the corner of the class. Um, I'm very chuffed actually that uh, we've raised that amount of money uh, on these talks and um, I suppose a gentle nudge, if anyone has sort of dug deep uh, for this evening, may I remind you to, to um, if you can, uh, make a little contribution because um, I think it's a good cause. And as I've said many, many times before, education is the hope of our world. Now, Le Misanthrope by Molière. I've chosen tonight one of the absolute greats of French literature. Um, the French often refer to the English language as la langue de Shakespeare, but you may not know that they refer to their own language, and you probably do know how much they prize their own language and their own culture. They refer to it as la langue de Molière, and there are many writers they could have chosen. It gives you some sense of the esteem in which they hold this great 17th century playwright. Um, while I think of it, by the way, um, if you're interested, this, this play is so well known in France. It is, I think, Molière's greatest play, but it's also his most challenging and most complex play. And I'll try and unpick that a bit tonight. But there's a very good YouTube uh, thing or uh, uh, video on YouTube. If you Google Macron and Le Misanthrope, you'll see... A, a journalist hijacking Macron somewhere a few years ago, 2017. And they basically reenact scene one, act one of this play. And Macron, astonishingly, I think this apparently wasn't a setup, knows Alceste's words off by heart. Pretty impressive. I don't know if Boris would pass that challenge. So can we have picture one, please? And, and picture one is the man himself. I hope, can you see him? Yeah, there he is, Molière. His real name was Jean-Baptiste Poquelin. Molière was a stage name uh, he took later on. And he was born into a, a prosperous family. His father was the royal upholsterer in charge of providing furnishings for the king. And uh, when he was born, the women clustered around. His mother noticed his rather large nose. I'm sort of sympathetic, you can see my side profile. I feel I'm a spiritual brother. And so his nickname, right from the word go, was Le Nez, the nose. And he was known uh, to his friends and associates as Le Nez throughout his life. So his father, um, as I say, had a very secure middle-class job and which, um, and that living, Molière himself was or Jean-Baptiste was, was uh, due to inherit. He was educated by the Jesuits. He had some legal training. We don't quite know how much. But then he disappointed his father 
by falling in love with the theater and or a lady called Madeleine Béjar, or possibly both. And he ran away basically and formed with her L'Illustre Théâtre, a theater troupe, and um, toured the provinces for 13 years from 1643 um, for 15 years when he returned to Paris in 1658. In 1645, I mean, it was a hand-to-mouth existence. It was a tough old life. He, was, he spent a day in prison for, for debts in 1645, but um, he eventually became director of the troupe. If you can go to uh, slide two, we're in Pizanas. There's a picture of two, as you can see, distinguished Latimerians there, myself and, and James, who was on a visit to us. But in the background is the statue of Molière. Pizanas is uh, deep south, deep in the Languedoc, about um, 15 miles off the Mediterranean coast. And four summers running in the 1650s, Molière and his troop uh, were hired to put on a series of plays for the Estates General, the regional government. So he spent a lot of time in the South. In fact, most of the 13 years, I know he was in Lyon, for example, he was touring in the South of France. So this statue um, is, uh, everything in Pézas is about Molière. There's a Hôtel Molière, there's a Café Molière, there's a Barber's, which has Molière's name, where apparently he used to have his uh, wig powdered. There's even a door that Molière used to bang on, uh, which is in a, a Musée de, de Portes, a museum of doors, in which is extraordinary. Everything is Molière there. And um, to the left, as, as you look, is a, a, a bosomy wench called Lucette, who appears in one of his farces, Monsieur de Porcelliac, uh, who bamboozles a, um, a provincial bourgeois by speaking in the local Pézanas dialect, which is effectively Occitan, which was hilarious if you're a Parisian, hilarious, and delighted these sophisticated Parisian audiences. And, and very rapidly on the other side is a satyr, S-A-T-Y-R, a figure of Greek mythology, a hideous creature, part man, part beast, uh, priapic, associated with bawdy, ribald behavior, uh, and these days more with satire. Slide three. This is a lovely picture of, of Moliere uh, in the far left in the brown there. Moliere is Arnold for the main character in his, his first really well-known Grande Comédie, uh, L'Ecole des Femmes, School for Wives. And the other uh, characters there are different farceurs, actors in farces. And it reminds us that Moliere was first and foremost an actor. That was his great skill. He was apparently a brilliant comic actor. His troupe actually performed lots of tragedies, which um, was seen to be rather more sophisticated than tragedy, which irritated Moliere a lot. Um, but he, in the early days, um, or in, in those days, a tragedy would be performed, and at the end, they would perform a little fuss. Fuss in French means stuffing, something to fill out the evening. You know, if I, I love tomate farci, for example, stuffed tomatoes, or uh, chou farci, stuffed cabbage, very nice French. So farce is uh, original, it means that. And uh, encouraged by the success of his comic acting, he started creating roles for himself and his troupe. So he learned his trade on the road. He was very influenced by the Commedia dell'arte, the Italian um, uh, theatre, which was uh, really involved a lot of improvisation, vague plot outline, a lot of far physical business, business called let's see people falling over each other. If you've seen James Corden, One Man, Two Governors, that originates from Goldoni is the servant of two masters, that sort of thing. So in that picture, you've got people like Harlequin, Arlecchino, Pantalone, Pantalone, um, the cuckold, the pretty widow, and other stock characters. And these stock characters recur in Moliere's comedy. He was also influenced by uh, Roman comedy, Plautus and Terence, the notion of the fearful servant who just wanted his wages and feared a beating. But as time went on, he moved towards more sophisticated comedy, which brings us to L'Ecole des Femmes in 1662. He's back in Paris then, and 
four years later, Le Misanthrope. So um, let's move on to the next picture. And this is a picture of a salon in uh, the 1650s, 1660s. It's actually a picture of Molière, there he is, reading out uh, his play Tartuffe. He wrote uh, the first version of Tartuffe in 1664. And at the center is a woman. It's very important. The salon was a feminist movement. She's Ninon de L'Enclos, one of the feminists. And it was a, a, a movement inspired by educated, emancipated women who encouraged the art of conversation. They were interested in the arts. They cultivated interesting intellectual guests. You may know that in France, it is acceptable to describe oneself as an intellectual. You would never do that in English. And in that picture, uh, I won't identify the word, both Cornet, Pierre Cornet, the great tragedian, and his brother Thomas, who was actually the biggest box office hit in France at the time. Racine is there, Lully, the great musician, La Fontaine and his fable. They're all there in that picture. Uh, and uh, playwrights would uh, go along to the salon and read out their plays and, uh, and there would be discussion. There were two social movements which are worth mentioning. One is preciosity, uh, les précieuses. Précieuses is, a, uh, is again a feminist with women who um, loved refinement of taste, uh, delicacy of language. When Orhant in, in Le Misanthrope in, in Act One brings on his sonnet and reads it out, that's, it's quite normal in that kind of context for someone to read out a poem. And his poem, by all accounts, isn't that bad, although Elsie's doesn't like it. Very much an intellectual aspiration and equality of the sexes. Uh, well, yeah, Paul, um, he did satirize the excess of the Prisciers in his first big play in Paris, Les Précieuses Ridicules, where they, they really go too far. They become over-refined. They refer to a chair, for example, as please bring up a commodity of conversation. The other um, uh, social trend it's worth talking about is the honnête homme, literally an honest man. Um, and it means a gentleman, if you like, um, a refined um, uh, intellectual. Uh, earlier in the century, Corneille wrote plays about gloire, honor, Spanish kind of honor, do or die stuff, a rigorous code of ethics, eth ethics. But as the century wore on, as Molière came into it, there was a preference for the social graces. There was a delight in intelligent social intercourse, moderation, and simplicity. Philant is an honnête homme, and it's an important uh, phrase. And act two of our play, Le Misanthrope, is really silly men holding court in a kind of salon. It's called the act of the, or the scene of the portraits where she gives what are called character, characters, witty and pithy characterizations, mostly slanderous in her case. Next slide is all about patronage. This is Moliere having lunch with Louis XIV, the Sun King, the great man. In uh, Moliere's great break was down in business. He was spotted by a nobleman called the Prince de Conti, um, who backed him and paid for him, basically, he's a, a wealthy man. Uh, and um, that unfortunately um, went belly up a few years later on when um, Prince de Conti contracted syphilis and his religious mentor said that this was a punishment, a divine punishment, and part of the reason for the punishment was that he supported the theatre, which of course was seen as immoral. So he dropped Moliere like a hot potato. Uh, his other big break, Moliere's other big break, was to attract the attention of, of the king and, and his brother, who was the, the, the famous Philippe, the Do Duc d'Orléans, Monsieur, his name was. And Moliere's troop eventually became known as the Troupe de Monsieur. And in his Paris days, when he returned to Paris, Moliere really needed that support and help. As I, I mentioned Tartuffe before, Tartuffe was a huge controversy. He, uh, he mocks um, religious extremism. And there are many contemporary parallels one might have. And the religious community, the cabal, the devil, uh, turned against him. Uh, the Archbishop of Paris uh, prescribed his plays and Louis XIV, who thought it was hilarious, the play, had to stop laughing because his mother was Anne d'Autriche and she was a very devout Catholic. So Louis XIV couldn't overtly support Moliere. Uh, his brother took on 
that. And um, four years later, two years later, in 1666, Le Miseltop was written. I think it's his most sophisticated comedy. And just to situate it, 1665 in London was the plague, the great plague. And so that was still raging as Moliere wrote this play. Uh, and three months after it was produced in 1666, the great fire of London broke out in Puddy Lane, 6th of September. The, the mise en was actually not a success. It was a bit of a commercial flop. And a couple of months later, in desperation, Moliere knocked up a, a quick three-act farce, Le Mise Saint-Magrini, the doctor in spite of himself, uh, which is it's actually quite funny, but it's not on the same level at all. But it was a great box office smash. And, and he carried on playing, uh, he carried on writing uh, plays after Le Mise en Laval, the miser, the bourgeois gentilhomme, some of you may know, Les Femmes Savantes, the Learned Ladies, or the Blue Stockings, and his final play, The Imaginary Invalid, or the Hypochondriac, Le Malade Imaginaire. And the irony there, you may know, is that on the evening of the fourth representation, he was taken ill. He, uh, he actually finished the production. He, was, he suffered from consumption, uh, and he was coughing up blood there. He suffered con con consumption for many years, uh, and he was carried out of the theater and died that evening in 1674. Next slide, please. Just to show you where the play was put on, the Palais Royal, very close to where the Comédie Française is now and close to the Louvre, which at the time was the King's Palace. Versailles existed, but the King didn't move out there till 1682, although some of Moliere's plays were put, out, put, put on out there. Uh, the Palais Royal was one of just two theaters in Paris. There were loads in London at the time, but only two in Paris, extraordinary. Most theater, uh, most, most um, acting troops put on plays in, on real tennis courts. So that's how Molière started. So he was lucky to get this. Uh, and, and he was playing to a very different audience to the one that Shakespeare would have known. There were no groundlings standing and throwing things uh, at the stage in France. They were, the middle classes sat in the, in the pit as it were and the aristocrats sat on in side boxes, even on stage, although the audience often were vocal. Okay, the next slides we'll rattle through. Uh, there, that's where the Palais Royal is, just above the Louvre. The next one, please. Here is some of the court dress. And I only show you for the, look at the gentleman on the left, and those rather wonderful lace frills on his knees. They are called canon, canons, and they're canons, and they were all the rage. And that will become uh, apparent or it will become important as you see the next slide, which is Alceste. And if you look closely, you can see he's wearing green ribbons around his knee, not very elaborate canons. Uh, I'm wearing green tonight, by the way, as a tribute to Alceste. Uh, green was associated in theatre at the time in France, certainly with eccentricity, indeed, madness, which I think is relevant to our interpretation of the play and some, some of you may see a wider residence that I've chosen that myself. Next slide, please. This is another picture of Alceste. This one, a splendid wig, and you can see he's still with his green ribbons round his knees. And the last picture is City Men, rather fetching picture, wearing a, a lovely dress. Okay, on we go. So the title of Mise en Trope, 1666, and the subtitle is La Trabilaire, Amour, which you might translate as the amorous black biled one or the cantankerous lover. Let's go on to the next slide, which tells you about the four humors. It was a, um, a theory at the time, which was in, you know, inherited from the time of Hippocrates in Greece, that the human beings, the temperament was decided by uh, the, the balance of humors. There are four of them in the body, the liquids in the body. There was black bile, which is what Alceste has, which um, uh, inclines him to be melancholic and quick-tempered uh, and filant, by contrast, on top right, is, has phlegm, phlegmatic, which gives us English phlegmatic, calm, easygoing. So the, 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 the other was a blood and yellow bar, which we won't spend time on now. Okay, on we go. So now this is the list of actors and um, just, just uh, to look at the, Alceste 
is not the lover of silly men. Uh, amant in modern French doesn't mean lover, but it means suitor here, an aspirant. Philan, to just to draw attention to his name, Phil, of course, means a lover of things, philosophy, lover of knowledge, Philan, a lover of human beings. So that sets up this contrast between the two main characters. Silly men, the fourth name down, is the amant d'Alceste. Again, not the lover of Alceste, but beloved of Alceste. Alceste is in love with her. Basque is just funny because uh, he's a valet, but Basque, literally from the Basque country, uh, there is an expression in, in French, you parle français comme un Basque espagnol, you really mangle French, you speak it like a Spanish Basque, or more often these days in France, they say, Parlez français comme une vache espagnole, like a Spanish cow. Um, so that, this would have amused the sophisticated Parisians by him coming on. He doesn't have many words in the play, but talking in a grotesque, deep southwest accent. And then Alceste Valley is Dubois, wood, and he's thick, basically, as you will see. Um, and, um, and he's the one act of well, one scene of farce in the play, Le Bisson Top is unusual. It's the most sophisticated comedy. A lot of his plays have a lot of physical business. There's very little in, in this play, but the last scene of Act Four uh, involves Dubois. And La Seine de Paris, that's all you get as a, a stage setting. But uh, Moliere observed the convention that the play would only take place in one place. That was the convention in 1650s, 1660s. And in fact, the situation of the play is in a room in Silliman's house, a room which people would come into where they would gather to come to visit her, where she would receive people. Eliant, her cousin, lives upstairs, we discover uh, in the play. Now, um, I, I mentioned that um, Alceste was quick tempered and prone to uh, melancholy. Uh, I went to see a, a production of Louise Trappe at the Comédie Française in 2017, where Alceste was played almost as if he had clinical depression. Um, they really emphasize the melancholy. And there's, a, there's been a long-standing argument, really, the last two, three hundred years, about whether Le Misanthrope is a comedy or is it really a tragedy? And uh, people take different points of view on that. I am firmly in the comedy camp, as I shall attempt to explain. But you may want to ponder that and to, uh, to think about that. OK, on to the play. This is the beginning of the play, and this is the bit that President Macron knows uh, perfectly well. It's a brilliant first act, famous in French literature, as this juxtaposition of two opposing thoughts. Basically, you've got Alceste, who stormed away from his friend, Philand, uh, who follows after him, says, Kisto, what's, what's, what's wrong? Leave me alone. Uh, but, but why? You know, uh, please go away and hide. But, but surely you listen to your friends without getting angry. And, and so as says line five here, moi, je veux me fâcher. I want to get annoyed. He's angry. I don't want to listen to you. But why, says Philant, uh, and uh, as says picking up there, moi, votre ami, your, me, your friend, réessayez dans vos papiers. You can cancel that one out, you know? Um, and what has Philant done to upset Alceste? He explains, je vous vois, I see you overwhelm a man with caresses. I'm fawning over this man. And bear witness for him for, of, the, of the, the utmost love, les dernières tendresses. Et quand je vous demande après, quel est cet homme? When I ask you who this man is afterwards, à peine pouvez-vous dire comme il se nomme? You can't even name who it is. You don't even know who it is. Mon bleu! Zooms, literally, that's a, um, a euphemism. Par la mort de Dieu, by God's death. Uh, you may know the expression in Restoration Tragedy, z death or zounds, by God's wounds. Um, Alceste's little tick is to keep saying mort bleu or tête bleu, by God's head. It's, a, as I say, a euphemism. And um, he goes on. <clears throat> Uh, by saying, I just need that text, excuse me, I can't see it. Yeah, um, he goes on after Morbleu, c'est une chose, and it's unworthy, lush, cowardly, infâme, outrageous, to lower yourself in this way, to s'abaisser ainsi, jusqu'à trahir son âme, just to, to, to betray your soul. And if by some misfortune, si par un malheur que je l'avais fait autant, I'd done the same, 
je m'irai de regret out of regret je m'irai pendre tout à l'instant I would go and hang myself immediately so there's a comic exaggeration there. and Fidant is really taken aback by by that page four yeah no <laughs> okay um next one yeah but so Fidan says well, what, what, what do you want me to do que voulez-vous qu'on fasse and that says je veux qu'on soit sincère i want people to be sincere and that as a man of honor one uh, releases no word speaks no word which doesn't come from the heart that's page eight on, on that four I don't know. Sorry, I've just lost my place here in my notes. Oh yeah, okay. Um, and he then says, je veux qu'on me disque. I want people to see me as different. I want to be distinguished. So next slide, please. I'm focusing on the printing bulb because it's just too much text. There's a lot of words in Act One, which is a brilliant dialogue. It's like a, a sword fight. So Finant here is saying, well, there are lots of places in les bien des endroits where open frankness, full frankness, deviendrait ridicule, would be ridiculous, or would be, you know, not permitted. Et parfois, sometimes, non déplaise, exaggerated, uh, sparing your austere honor. Il est bon de cacher. It's good to hide ce qu'on a dans le cœur, what you have in, in your heart. In parenthesis, this play you will have seen is written in verse, rhyming couplets, Alexandria's. Every line in this play has 12 syllables, extraordinary. And yet, this is Molière's genius. The language is so natural, it flows, very it's not at all stilted in French. So Philan says, you know, the next bit of bold. Quoi? Vous iriez dire la vie? What would you, would you really go and tell old Emily over there that at her age, she really is not, it's not right to try and be, you know, doll herself up. Et que le blanc est là. In those days, you wore white powder on your face as a lady because to be white was a, a sign of class. It meant you didn't work in the fields to get a suntan. So she's plastered her face with white powder. And, and would you really go and tell old Emily over there that she really shouldn't wear that white powder? It's, it's a scandal for everyone. Yeah, of course, sans doute. <laughs> Next slide. So, <clears throat> I'm not joking, says Alceste. Je vais ne pas dire, I'm not going to spare anyone. So he's, 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 I think this is black and white. Mes yeux sont trop blessés. My eyes are too wounded, literally. I'm too offended. Et la cour et la ville. Give me that. Part. Et la cour et la ville. Ne m'offre rien qu'objet à m'échauffer la bile. My, and the court and the town offer me only objects which heat up my bile. There are a number of references to his black bile as we go. Now, a brief explanation of la cour et la ville. La cour, of course, is the court, Louis XIV's court. And la ville is the city of Paris. He means middle class society. And he goes on, j'entre. En humeur noire, I, I get into a black mood, black humor, or a chagrin profond, a profound chagrin. Quand je vois vivre entre eux les hommes comme when I see men living as they are amongst themselves, je le trouve partout. I only see everywhere cowardly flattery, lâche flatterie, injustice, injustice, self interest, anti trahison, treachery, fourberry, trickery. I can't. Take it anymore. Je ne puis plus tenir. J'enrage, it drives me mad. Et mon dessin and my plan est de rompre à tout le genre humain. Rompre is an expression which comes from the joust. If you imagine you're on a horse, I mean, you're coming to meet a, a, a knight. If you rompre you aim your lance right into the visor of the opposing knight. In other words, he's going to take society head on. He's in direct opposition to society. Next slide, please. I need a bit of refreshment. So Fiat then says, you know, he's now becoming sincere that the whole play is about different shades, nuances on the theme of sincerity. Fiat now begins to talk very frankly to him. The two 
lines in Bonjour vous dirais, I'll tell you very frankly then, that your illness, and he refers to it as an illness for the audience to decide whether they agree, partout où vous allez, wherever you go, you have people laughing at you, donne la comédie. Next slide, please. So, Fina says, so, tous les pauvres mortels, all, are all mortals, without any exception, sans une exception, seront enveloppés dans cette, are, are they going to be wrapped up into this aversion? You hate everyone. Encore en est-il bien, now in, in, in today's time, dans le siècle où nous sommes, non, il est général, my aversion is general, et je hais tous les hommes, I hate all mankind. Les uns, this is a brilliant piece of language, les uns parce qu'ils sont méchants, some because they're wicked, et malfaisant, and, and maleficent, doing, they do bad things, et les autres, and others, pour être aux méchants complaisants, to be complacent to the wicked, to, in other words, to indulge the uh, wicked. Okay, next one. So uh, there are three key pieces of information conveyed in Act One, Scene One. Hugely important play. One ancestor is pretty bonkers in my view, and he's taking extreme view. Some some people argue that Philand is equally extreme the other way. He's almost too acquiescent in in the vices of the time. That's another interesting discussion point. The, the second thing is that uh, ancestor is involved in a court case. And some scoundrel is suing him uh, with, you know, baseless, uh, in, as we only hear else his version, baseless uh, case, and, uh, uh, you know, a, a, an absolute hypocrite, that first bit of bold, le franc s'élira, s'élira, criminal, some criminal, avec qui j'ai procès, with whom I have a, a lawsuit, nommez-le fourbe, infâme, you, people call him a trickster, He's outrageous, he's a cursed criminal, c'est les ramaudis. Tout le monde en convient, everyone agrees, yes he is. Et nul n'y contre, no one argues against that. Cependant, however, sa grimace est partout, bienvenue, grimace, doesn't mean pulling a face, it means hypocrisy here, is welcome everywhere. On l'accueille, he's welcomed. On lui rit, people smile with him. Partout, il s'insinue, he insinuates himself everywhere. And then he, he blows up, you know, the next one, tête bleue, by God's head. Ce me sont de mortelles blessures, if he's dying, these are deadly wounds to me. De voir, to see qu'avec le vice on garde, but people even have any truck with vice. Et parfois, sometimes, il me prend des mouvements. Soudain, I get sudden urges de fuir dans un désert, l'approche des humains, to flee human beings. And, and take refuge in a desert. Now that prefigures the ending of the play because this is actually what he does at the end of the play. But, but we should be clear that uh, ancestor is not off to the Sahara or the Kalahari. What he means by a desert, Paris being the most centralized uh, or city or uh, France being the most, is he's probably going down to kind of Croydon or Walthamstow. You know, he's going out to the boring suburbs where everyone's, you know, social suicide. Uh, anywhere which is not really the court or the sophisticated um, city life. Next one, please. How are we doing? Mm -hmm. Fila just trying to pour oil on troubled waters. Mon Dieu, for heaven's sake, des morts du temps mettons nous moins open. Let's, let's not get so wound up about contemporary morals, manners, behavior. If faisant un peu grâce à la nature humaine, give, give human nature a bit of a break. Next, the bold line. Il faut parmi le monde, in society, parmi le monde, il faut une vertu traitable. You, you need a tractable, malleable virtue. It must be too excessively virtuous. A force de sagesse, by virtue or by dint of wisdom, on peut être blâme, one could be condemned. La parfaite raison, Perfect reason, fuit toute extremité. That's the great byword of Philand. Flees any extremity. Et veut que l'on soit sage avec sobriété and wants people to be, to behave sensibly, soberly, avec sobriété. Et c'est une folie, it's a folly. 
à nul autre secours, second to none, de vouloir se mêler, de corriger le monde, to want to get involved in correcting the world, changing society. It's just not going to happen. And the last two lines are in bold. Et je crois, and I think that in the court and in the city, in the town, more flag, this is his, this is his, his humor, his phlegmatic humor, a philosophe, his, his wise, his sensible, que votre bile is your black bile. There's the contrast. So that's the nub of the exchange between them, which sets the tone of the whole thing. The next slide, please. And so, um, <laughs> this is just a little exchange, but um, Philand is talking about the court case which Alceste is involved in, and, and um, Alceste blows a fuse at the end. He says, you know, Philand says, well, you must, you must talk to people. You must talk to the right people and make sure you get people on your side. That's what people do. You have to play the game, grease a few palms. Alcès says, no, I'm not doing that. J'aurai le plaisir de perdre mon procès. I will have the pleasure of losing my law case and that will confirm my prejudice. Next one. Of course, the great paradox, and this is the third element of the first scene, is that here we have a man who rails at insincerity and hypocrisy. Who does he fall in love with but silly men? young woman, a young widow, 20 years of age, uh, who is the very embodiment of everything which by rights he ought to detest. She, she's a real social animal. It's worth a biographical interlude here. And Molière, well, when he was 40 uh, in 16, 40, 53, is it? No, 63, two or three years before this play, married Armand de Béjar, who was the illegitimate daughter, illegitimate daughter of Madeleine Bijard, the woman he'd run away with 20 years before. Uh, and uh, Armand was a brilliant actress, very witty actress. Uh, and she was a coquette, she was a flirtatious girl. And, and Molière was jealous. He was 40, she was 17, explosive mix. But he wrote the part of Alceste for himself and he wrote the part of uh, Silly Men for Armand, and I think that informs uh, the play. There's some reality going on here behind. So Finant is saying, you know, in the bold bit here, Suki Monsieur, what, what, what's really strange though, is the curious choice in which your heart has engaged itself. Votre cœur s'engage. He talks about Eliante, Siemens' cousin, La Sainte, who is the stock epithet. that she's a sincere, straight, lovely girl, the sort of girl you'd like your son to marry. And she fancies Alceste. Elle a du penchant pour vous. She likes you. Uh, also, la prude Arsinoé. Arsinoé comes in later. A prude uh, also sees you with a sweet eye. She's got a bit of a soft spot for you. So Alceste clearly, despite his irascibility, is attractive to women. And yet, it's silly men who uh, has captured your heart, he says. Uh, and the next speech by Philand in that, in bold, pour moi, I hope you're able to follow me, pour moi, uh, si je n'avais qu'à former, if, if, if I was asked, Philand said, if I was asked to express my desires, la cousine d'Eliante, or which she would, uh, Eliante, Sylvain's cousin, would have all of my sighs. Son cœur qui vous estime, cœur, her heart, which honors you, est solide et sincère. Et ce choix plus conforme était mieux votre avis, and you'd be far better off with Eliant. And Alceste does acknowledge this. Il est vrai. Ma raison me le dit. Reason tells me this every day. And then the famous line. Mais la raison n'est pas ce qui règle l'amour. A truth. Reason is not what governs love. And that's one of the dynamics of this play. The dynamic, if I go on about that a bit more, is that the, the, what drives this play is Alceste is, where is he? He's in Silly Ben's house. He's waiting to see Silly Ben to complain to her that she sees too many suitors uh, and to have it out with her. You know, that's what he said. And he's constantly frustrated. Uh, people keep interrupting him. And that's one of the gags, the running gags of the play. It f follows a play he'd written a few 
years before called Les Fâcheux, which had much abused Louis XIV, which is boys trying to be girl, and 10 different people, one after the other, come, they're importunate, they are Fâcheux, they get in his way and stop him seeing the girl he wants to chat up. Moliere in that play, by the way, played the eight male characters, the eight important, so it shows you his versatility as a comic actor. Okay, at this moment, next slide, please, in comes Ohort, who um, is a bit self-regarding uh, 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 and also a suitor of Sidney, which is why he's there. And he happens upon us as well, um, and said, well, now you're here, let me, let me read to you a sonnet I've, I've just uh, written. And of course, that, in this context, that's nothing particularly untoward. So what happens next is he starts reading out his sonnet and Philand, being a nice chap, said, oh, that's a wonderful turn of phrase, thank you. And Alceste is muttering in Philan's ear, this is rubbish, that's awful. You know, there, there's a comic play there. And uh, eventually, all finishes his sonnet and said, well, what do you think? I want your honest opinion, says Oron. Oh, well, of course, you don't want the honest opinion. It's like asking someone how they are. You don't actually want to hear if their piles are playing up, oh, do you? You don't want to hear that. You just want to hear, oh, that's fine. It's just, just one of those, it, it oils the social wheels. So Alceste, this is hilarious. Alceste says, Monsieur, very politely, cette matière est toujours délicate. It's a very delicate matter, this. You're asking my opinion. Uh, and as far as wit is concerned, le bel esprit, nous aimons qu'on nous flatter. We love to be flattered, don't we? But, and then he, he tries to kind of deflect the thing. One day, un jour, à quelqu'un, I was, I was chatting to someone, dont je tire rien, I won't tell you his name, Je disais, en voyant des vers, and I was saying, seeing some poetry uh, after his own fashion, qu'il faut that, that a, a, a gentleman uh, should exercise control, grand empire, sur les démangeaisons, on the itchings that he gets <laughs> to write. In other words, you shouldn't write, basically. So, oh, I said, well, est-ce que vous voulez me dire, are you? Saying then that I'm que j'ai tort, are you saying I'm wrong to want to? Je dis pas cela. So, this is again, as this doesn't have the courage of convictions, he can't. You know, remember what he said, he was going to go and tell Emily across the road and tell her she was wearing too much makeup. Here, face to face, he can't actually say to Orhant, I don't like your poem. And I, I've missed most of this out, but you can see the dots are there. This go, this is played out. And each time, Alceste belies his true nature by saying, no, I'm not saying that. Well, of course he is saying that. He is actually saying that. And then at the end of the scene, he blows a fuse. He just loses his temper, says, franchement, frankly, you should stick it down the toilet. Il, il, il est bon à mettre au cabinet, which, sparks off a bit of a spat between the two gentlemen, a face-off, Oron storms off and then causes him trouble as Philant uh, anticipates there. So that's Act One. I spent a lot of time on that because it underpins the whole thing. I'm gonna to have to rattle through. If you go to the next um, slide, please. I'm gonna rattle through these. This is Alceste complaining to Sim. He's eventually got a, an audience with her and um, you can see the bold thing. Vous avez trop d'amour, you've got too many suitors. Uh, Silly Bain, of course, is disingenuous in, in the bold line in her second son, Puis Jean Pichin, can I prevent people from liking me? She says, Puis Jean Pichin, les gens de me trouver aimable. And, and should I take a stick to beat them? She says, of course. Not expecting the answer, no. Next slide, please. Um, <clears throat> So uh, basically, Sullivan toys with us, so she can wrap him round her little finger. He says, but how do I know that, that, that you actually, you know, that you distinguish me? Uh, you blame me for being jealous. Um, what have I got that others haven't? And she says, her bold, bold line, le bonheur de savoir que vous êtes aimé, the happiness to know that you're loved. And um, and and as I said, well, what 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 um, you know? How do I know that? And said, you better pas je pense. Well, I think having taken the trouble to tell you that, uh, you know, a confession of that sort, 
it, that's quite enough to satisfy you. She's hiding behind her, her mask of femininity, if you like, here. Uh, and um, and says, pursues the next boulder, mais qui m'assure, who, who will uh, reassure me that at the same time, you're not saying the same thing to lots of others. Ah, so that's a, a lovely compliment. I, in a previous talk, I talked to you about la fleurette comes from the Italian, uh, uh, gives you the English word flirt. That, that, that's, a, that's a cute compliment to give me. Thank you for doubting me. And she turns the tables on him. And so in the next little bit of bulk, two lines down, eh bien, okay then. And she calls his bluff. So, so, so you don't have that problem anymore. De tout ce que j'ai dit, je me dédie everything I said before, I now did that. So I didn't say, I didn't mean it. You're not special to me. Morbleu, zooms, shouts, uh, says, why do I love you? You know, he's beside himself. <laughs> the next one, please. Okay, we're in act two here and accelerating. Uh, let's, let's cut that one out. Let's go on to the next slide, please. Uh, this is um, uh, a very good scene uh, where Clitandre and Akas the Fops, the Marquis, stop figures in Molière comedy with uh, Orant and with Eliante of Yongala and uh, Célibin holds court. And the two Fops basically trigger, offer her a trigger statement and I mentioned her name, and then she gives what's called a, a character, a portrait, slanderous portrait, very witty, beautifully phrased. So the first one is, Barbara, good heavens, I've just come from the Louvre. I've just come from the palace. He's got, because of, you know, bigging himself up here. I've just come from the palace. I'm one of those. Where Cléant at the Louvre, now the Louvre, uh, Louis, you need to know Louis XIV, um, basically his strategy in, in France, uh, there had been civil war in France. Uh, up to about 13 years before 1652, uh, a huge revolt called La Fronde. And, um, and so to counter that, he brought all the nobility to Paris and then occupied them. It wasn't bread and circuses, but he gave them, you know, playwrights like Moliere to entertain them, for example. And he had a very elaborate daily rituals. Every morning at eight o'clock, he would, um, he'd be woken up by his valet, he may not have, the valet slept in Louis XIV's bedroom. Louis XIV probably slept somewhere else because he sired a lot of illegitimate children, but he would turn up at his own bedroom at eight in the morning, curtains would be drawn, and his nurse would kiss him, uh, and people would examine the uh, contents of the chamber pot. This is in front of a large crowd of noblemen who basically jostled for position. They jockeyed for position, this was an influential thing to do. So people pay actually to go to be there and to be seen, it's all about being seen. And so um, Cléton said, well, what do you think about Cléon? He, 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 he looked absolutely ridiculous, he says. And Sennemann says, yeah, he, he does, um, he, he's very ostentatious. He's a barbouille fort, he's very ostentatious. Partout, everywhere he goes, he, he wears an air which kind of jumps into your face, as it were. He's not subtle at all. Et lorsqu'on le revoit, when you see him again, having not seen him for a while, après un peu d'absence, you find him encore plus plein. He's a dexter, he's full of extravagance. So there are lots of these, about eight or nine of these, one after the other. And it shows that Sidney Men is a very clever girl, very witty, a great wordsmith. Next see. Next uh, slide, please. Uh, we'll cross over, we'll, we'll just leave that one. That's uh, not, not time for that. Um, but we'll cross over that as well. This is the fops preening themselves and so on. And then in, in Act Three, Silly Ben is with uh, the two fops and Arsinoe is announced. Arsinoe is the prude. And this again is just one of the best scenes in the play. Uh, she's announced, and before she arrives, Silly Ben gives her portrait to Akast. Uh, Akast calls her prude, of course, a consummate prude. And Sélimen says, oui, oui, franche grimace, pure hypocrisy. In her heart, dans l'âme, elle est du monde. She is a social animal. Uh, and her interests try to, to do everything. Pour accrocher quelqu'un, to try and hook a lover, a suitor. Sans en venir à bout. She, she can't basically pull, she can't pull a bloke. 
Um, and she's jealous. She's jealous of me because here, look at me, I'm surrounded by suitors and admirers. She refers to the last line of that little bit of bold to her triste mérite, her, her unflattering looks. And she's abandonné de tous, abandoned by everyone. It's very cruel. She's very lonely. Okay. Uh, she does know that Alceste uh, is um, a glint in Arsino's eye, as you can see in the next little bit of bold. And at the end of this little speech, just as Arsino is about to come in, she says, enfin, the last two lines, je n'ai rien vu de si, I've, done, I've not seen anyone. So stupid, as far as I'm concerned. Elle est impertinente au suprême degré. She's the very last word, that person. Arsino comes in and she's, ah, oh, wonderful to see you. So lovely to see you. It shows, reveals her hypocrisy. Next slide, please. And so, uh, wonderful scene. This is of, of two bitches, really, scratching each other's eyes out. Arsino says, um, she, she, she wears the mask of sincerity here. And she says, look, I had to pop in because um, I was at some friend's house uh, yesterday. Again, I'm focusing on the bold print. Hier, j'étais chez lui. I was at some people's house. De vertu, so very high virtue, where um, people started talking about you. And your conduct, madame, with its extravagant nature, had the misfortune, she's lying through her teeth, of course, that it was not praised, ne la loua pas, that it was not praised. And she goes on to detail, pretending it's not her own view, uh, uh she's got too many suitors, she's a coquette, everyone's talking about it. Um, of course, it's not true, and I tried to defend you, uh, uh, and she has her say. So Selimen listens to this, tongue in cheek, teeth clenched, no doubt, and says, well, thank you so much for telling me that. And I'm really grateful. And, you know, thank you for taking the trouble to come to see me. Uh, funnily enough, I was with some friends yesterday and here comes the counter thrust. I want to follow, she says, the, the bold in, in, the, in the, je veux suivre à mon tour in, in turn, uh, such a, a fine example, an example of Sidou, en vous avertissant and warning you uh, what people are saying about you. And she then, this is a perfect construction here, she now uses the structure and words that Arsinoe used and turns them against her. Um, she said, you know, I, oh, I, knew, I, I, was, I was visiting someone the other day and some people of rare merit, of rare merit were talking about you. And um, you weren't quoted as, as a good example. And then I'm on now to the bold here at the bottom. A quoi bon? I hope you're with me here. Are you in this one? A quoi bon, Dizzy? So this is what people were saying. What, what's the point of her modest expression? Dizetti, cette mi de modeste. Et ce sage duo, this um, prudent exterior. Que dément tout le that everything else belies. Elle est à bien prier, exact au dernier. She's very punctilious about praying. She's devout. Molière well, yeah, loves ripping it out of religious hypocrites. Mais elle bat ses gens et ne les paye pas. She beats her servants and doesn't pay them. Uh, dans tous les lieux dévots, in all the devout places, the churches, elle est à, she displays, demonstrates great zeal. Where am I here? Thank you. Mais elle met du blanc, here we are, back to the white powder again, mutton dressed as lamb, but she puts white powder on, elle veut paraître belle, if, and she wants to appear beautiful, which of course implies very directly that she isn't beautiful, like Céline. And then the last two lines were brilliant, elle fait des tableaux, couvrir les nudes, she's the kind of woman who will cover up nudes in a painting or a statue because it outrages her modesty. Mais, but, elle a de l'amour pour les réalités. Réalité here means sex, basically. She actually really loves sex. It's a, a, a polite way of saying it. And all the more forceful for being so 
polite. So this is not a meeting of minds. Uh, next one, please. So, um, yeah, the, the play goes on. Uh, um, Siliman basically um, sees that Ancestor arrives and, and uses him as an excuse to escape, leaves Arsinoe and Ancestor together. And Arsinoe says, you know, I don't know why you like silly men and as he said well hang on you're supposed to be her friend aren't you why are you speaking against them well it's just that i've got various things in my possession which might suggest to you that she's not a good choice for you and uh, so so he's pricked up his ears of course and, and the last two bold lines and she said well you know come to my house uh, and i have proof that this is the case et si last two lines pour d'autres yeux le vôtre peut brûler and if your own eyes can burn. This is a language of a bit like metaphysical poetry, burn with love. If your, your heart can burn for other eyes, you know, in the language of the time, uh, poison would come from the beautiful woman's eyes into your eyes, and you'd be, you'd be literally poisoned with love. It's something you couldn't resist. Or pourra vous offrir, one might be able to offer you something to console you. In other words, I can offer you some consolation. <laughs> uh, and again, um, very um, refined language expressing a concept which isn't so refined at all. Next one, please. Well, um, act, we're in Act 4 now, and as has seen the letter which he thinks is written by, by, by Sinibin to Oron declaring love for him, and he comes back and is intercepted by Iliant and, and Philand. And he uses the language of tragedy, actually. Ah, tout est ruiné, everything's ruined. Je suis, je suis trahi, I'm betrayed, je suis assassiné. This could come straight out of a, a play by Racine. Célimen, could you believe this news? Célimen me trompe, she's deceiving me, she's unfaithful. So the next stanza, so the next slide, please. Uh, as says now, Sullivan arrives, and uh, as says confronts her with this. Okay, um, there you are, talk your way out of that one. And of course, Sullivan does. She basically says, "Well, um, who says that it's someone I'm in love with?" We said, "Well, it's obvious." And then, and then she really chops me. I say, "Well, who says I've addressed that to a man? Might be a girlfriend she's written to." And so as this, who kind of wants to believe that silly men uh, uh, makes him feels that he's special, he's beguiled again, although rails his own, he's very aware of his own weakness. She's got me again. <laughs> um, and that is the, uh, the, the really the, the heart of this, this scene. We're not gonna have time uh, to go through that all. So let's go on to the next. We're now in the last um, act, and things are coming to a head. Um, as this is still in doubt about silly men, and he comes in at the beginning of Act Five and announces that he has lost his court case, which was mentioned in Act One. And in that bold line, "J'ai pour moi la justice, justice is for me, et je perds mon procès, and I lose my case." And Fila said, well, come on, no, you, you can ap appeal to people. There are, well, we know people who can help you here. We can sort this out. Uh, and you might need to pay a bit of money. You know, you might need to grease a few palms. And he says, no, no, no. And in the next little bold couplet, je veux qu'il demeure à la posterité. I want him to, to remain for posterity comme une marque insigne. Insigne doesn't mean insignificant, it means significant like a, a, a significant sign, a definite sign, a fameux témoignage, a famous proof de la méchanceté des hommes, the spite of men in our society. Next, uh, next one, please. Getting towards the end now. Philad tries to uh, humor him, he says, yeah, I look, I, I get it, you know, je tombe d'accord de tout ce qui vous plaît, I, I agree with you. Tout marche par cabal, cabal is a conspiracy, everything works through conspiracy and plotting, ou par pur intérêt, through self-interest. 
So n'est plus que la ruse aujourd'hui que l'employé. If people just need trickery, ruse to to win the day. Et les hommes devraient être faits. Donc, the men should be should be different. Mais est-ce une raison que leur pédé qui que leur peu de qui is there lack of fairness a reason pour vouloir se tirer de leur société for you to want to withdraw from society basically if you know you can't change human nature you've got to roll with the punches you've got to run with it les ivois says alcest i'm here to have it out finally with city men and to ask her if she will come to the desert with me come out flee society uh, with me okay the next one please and what has happened here is that uh, Acast and Clitant the fops have come in holding letters uh, with Arsinoe and these are letters that Sediman has written to each of them and each of them um is rude about the other person and so i guess you don't read these letters out so this is a public embarrassment my humiliation for siba here in the court of public opinion they're all gathered together this is to write the climax of the play silly men for once has nowhere to hide she is caught akas reads out the letter that she wrote to him being rude about Clitant Clitant does the same and at this point Arsinoe in Portugal as ever says well and here we have it set voilà le trait du mot le plus this is outrageous je ne m'en serai pas I can't remain silent I'm moved by this voit-on des procédés qui soient par exemple and she's reproaching see but has one ever seen any people proceed in 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 the, in the way that you do Je ne prends point de part aux intérêts, of course, and then she, I'm not taking other people's part, well, she is, and, and this is the way language is used to mean the very opposite of what it literally means. Mais monsieur, and she's referring here to Anceste, who had pinned his happiness on you, and Anceste interrupts her famously, laissez moi madame, je vous prie, uh, madame, please leave me, uh, let me uh, pursue my own interests, vide mes intérêts moi-même là-dessus. Et ne vous chargez point de ces soins, your, your cares for me are superfluous. This is a great put down coming here. Mon cœur a beau voir, a beau voir is to do something in vain. My heart um, sees you in vain, literally, take up my quarrel. It's not, you, no, there's no point in you taking up my quarrel. Uh, my heart, in the Point en état, it is not in a state de payer, so you want to pay your zeal for me. Et ce n'est pas à vous, and it's not to you, que je pourrais songer. I wouldn't be thinking of you, he says, si par un autre choix je cherche à me venger, if I seek to avenge myself on silly bit by choosing another woman. In other words, you're the last person I would choose. So, um, Arsinoui leaves definitively in a huff uh, and then I think two more quick scenes as it these are all this is all the final scene two more extracts next slide please and so um this is the ultimate this is really what as we wanted to say to city men throughout the whole play come away with me make me special treat me specially, leave your other suitors, let's go away and have our romantic idyll together. That's the offer. And I'm just going to look at the bits in bold print. Oui, je veux bien perfide, oublier vos feuilles, prepared to forget her, uh, her crimes. I am happy, perfide, traitor, perfide again is a, a word used in tragedy, traitress, uh, to forget your crimes. Jean Sauré, dans mon âme, excusez tous les traits. I will excuse all the barbs, les traits, uh, in my heart and my soul, et me les couvrirai du nom d'une faible, and I'll accept them as my own personal weakness, ou le vice du temps, or the vice of the times, uh, or, or sorry, where, sorry, where contemporary vices have taken your youth. In other words, he's prepared to excuse her because of her youth. She's 20, remember, she's a 
a, a widow, very smart. You know, the idea was to marry an old man who's rich. He would pop his clogs and then you had money and you could play the field. That's what she's doing. So, pourvu que, and he gives, this is the ultimate, pourvu, provided that, pourvu que votre cueil veuille donner les mains, uh, as long as your heart will um, take, um, will grasp, if you like, au dessin que j'ai fait, the plan I have made, de fuir tous les humains, to flee human beings, society, et que mon, dans mon désert, dans my desert, where I've determined to live, you, you should resolve to live with me without any further delay. This is the time to choose. And what does she say? What? <laughs> Give up society, renonce au monde, avant que de before I'm old, et dans votre désert, allez, mon seul go and bury myself, or civilly like sepulchre, to I go and bury myself in your desert, your suburban horror. So that's her answer. And so mock heroically at this point, I says, right, off you go, you're banished. I want nothing more to do with you. You've, you've, you've missed your opportunity. And then he does pose in the very last uh, slide, please. The last words of the play. He makes a, a kind of quasi-tragic speech. This is the sort of speech, again, a tragic hero who's lost everything at the end of a play might make. Trahi de toutes parts, betrayed on all sides, accablé d'injustice, overwhelmed with injustice. Je vais sortir d'un gouffre, I'm going to leave literally a gulf, a, a pit, an abyss, où triomphe les vices, where vices triumph. Et chercher sur la terre, and I'm going to seek on the earth, an endroit écarté, some distant place, où d'être homme d'honneur, on est les libertés, where one is free to be a man of honour. And then, actually, they aren't the last words of the play, he, he strides off, mock heroically, or tragically, if you see the play as a tragedy. And the last words are with Philin, who by the way, Philant and Eliot have sealed their betrothal in this last scene. And in the play, uh, Philan says, let's run after him and stop him doing this crazy thing. And that's how the play is left. In the production I saw in 2017, Philan says that. And then Philan and Eliot look at each other. And instead of running after him, they go upstairs. And that's how they end. They chose to end the play, but that, that is directorial discussion. So there you have it. I've overrun a little bit. I could do with a little bit more wine, please, my darling wife. And um, if anyone's still, is anyone still there? Have I driven you all away? We're all, we're all, we're all still here, Peter. That was, that was fantastic. And, and you, um, you, your translation is so fluid. I'm always left with this kind of deluded impression that I understand every word, which um, is wonderful while it lasts. Clint, um, Clint that that illusion, Sean. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, uh, so we've got a, a question here. I don't know, John. Do you want to read? Do you want to read it yourself, or shall I? Are you there, John? I am here. Yeah. Can you hear me? Okay. But far away. Um, Peter, thank you for that. I, I've discovered uh, two famous French works recently, this one and uh, Madame Bovary. Well done. And there, there seems to be some sort of similarities. Did Bovary just uh, sort of move Moliere to Normandy? <laughs> your well, there are, well, there, actually, there are laughs in Madame Bovary, but they're, they're incredibly cruel, aren't they? Um, that's a very interesting thought. I've never really explored in detail whether, um, you know, um, Le Bise, Le Madame Bovary is, is a Norman version of Le Misanthrope. Um, it depends who, the, who, who is the Misanthrope, I wonder, in Madame Bovary. I don't see Charles that is a victim, isn't he, really? He thinks he's happy, uh, whereas Alcest knows he's unhappy. Um, for example, Emma aspires to be happy, whereas throughout the play, Sullivan is blissfully happy, uh, pulling all the strings, wheeling men in, you know, playing one off against the other. It's a great game until 
the moment when she is exposed. Uh, is that a moral ending? I, I doubt it. I don't look to Moliere for moral ending, but it's, it's funny. She meets her comeuppance, if you like. But the ambiguity, I think, is really in the character of as says to what extent we take him seriously, or is he a buffoon? I mean, is he just completely unrealistic? I mean, how can you change human nature? Are, are we really gonna be relentlessly honest to everyone? I mean, are you gonna tell me that you, you may think I look ridiculous in a beard, John, which is probably entirely true, but are you gonna tell me? I mean, I have feelings, okay? So uh, let's not pursue that, but you see what I mean. You go out of your way <laughs> to tell people a home truths. That's what Ancest is wanting, and that's the, the dramatic, the dialect, the dramatic opposition of the two main characters. <laughs> it's okay, I've got a lockdown beard as well. <laughs> I thought I could say that with you then. All righty, thanks. Thanks, John. Nice to, thanks for the Thank question. You. Um, Peter, is this, was this a, a text that, I mean, I know you've got quite a few of your former students here. We've got Jamie, we've got um, James and, and Rupert. Did you teach them Moliere? Did they, is this, is this a, a, a piece uh, that you... I, I don't, I... Jamie, do you have? I, I, I have, yes, you did. You did. Yeah. yeah. Was it this play? Yeah, I mean, the trouble is, it all merges. It's a long time ago, but I think so, Peter. I, I, I don't remember you wearing green when you were teaching us. Uh, yeah. it, but I, you're getting into character these days, Jamie. It's a bit sad. But, no, I, I think it's great, but um, I, I, I do remember it. Uh, so uh, yeah, I think you did. And that, that was great, Peter, Thank, thanks so much. I was interested by Russo, Russo right afterwards said, you know, this isn't a comedy, it's a tragedy. Was he the guy that said it was a tragedy? I think yeah. it was. Yeah, um, yeah. Well, he was. Or he said, we shouldn't make him, a, well, he's not a comic figure, is, is that right? Exactly, Russo, um, Russo not known really for his sense of humor, frankly. Um, thought that um, he was distraught, actually, that um, such a noble man as Alcest, taking him seriously, could be the subject of ridicule. And, and the other famous French literary figure, Musset, a, a romantic poet, early 19th century, went to a production of uh, Le Misotop at the Comédie Française and wrote a long poem about it, which is pretty sad in itself, I suppose. He talks about the mal gaieté, the male gaieté, si triste et si profonde, uh, that, you know, while we're laughing at it, we ought to be weeping for it. So, but these are romantic, you know, romantic weep. They get moved, don't they, I think. And, and, you know, it's a legitimate reading of the play. Um, it's just not one that works for me. I just think Moliere is about laughs funny. He wrote this part for himself, all the indications for me, well, it's fun to chat about it, you know. Um, Does anyone... I, I've taught a number of Moya plays over the years. I did Don Juan myself for A-Level, which is the play he wrote before Le Misotop. Um, so he wrote 31 plays, and I can't say I've read them all. I've read quite a few. Um, but only about six, seven, eight, these five-act plays in verse. A lot of his plays are in, 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 in prose. So that I'm assuming would have been for A level, Jamie. I'm ass I'm assuming. Yeah, well, Peter, I I think you did. So so I did A level in uh, 1975, yeah. and I'm pretty sure I'm pretty sure you did this for A level then. Yeah, I may well have done. It, it, I I do have my um, all of my registers. <laughs> <laughs> And if you did it, Howard, I must have done it as well, because no, I was in the same done. class. You know, yeah, but you wouldn't have done it as well as me, no. <laughs> I remember Zadig, uh, Rupert, because that was the first one I did. I was curious. <laughs> but, um, uh, yeah, sadly, I did note down all the books I taught, but I haven't actually got them to hand, so I don't know. But it's entirely plausible. I have got a soft spot. No, I mean, a lot of people, a very good friend of mine, Nigel, who may be listening tonight, who's a great um, Moliere fan and expert, doesn't think Moliere, and that doesn't rate Le Misotop as his best player. He's, he loves the Maladie Major, the comedy ballet. You know, there are, there are so many different points of view. I, I think Le Misotop is just beyond brilliant. I love it. As well, I Rupert, Rupert <laughs> you, you, um, you've written a question. Would you, would you read it out or would you like me to? No, by all means, I'll, I'll, I'll read it out. I mean, it Peter, my thought was it's a terribly clever play. It's very amusing dialogue and all yeah. the rest of it. But there's not really a great amount of action 
you know, nothing much happens really. Um, no, well, you know, we, is, 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 is that why it failed initially commercially? You you wait till I get onto Racine next time, Ruth. <laughs> <laughs> Where nothing happens very slowly for two and a half hours. <laughs> They're going to try and infuse you as a, a, about that. Yeah, it was. It's different. It's. I mean, people call it a dark comedy. It is more serious, if you like, than his other plays. You know, uh, in Tartuffe, which is the famous play, uh, for example, you've got a scene in Act Four where um, Orgon, this, this bourgeois man, is infatuated by the religious hypocrite. Everyone knows he's a charlatan. Everyone knows, apart from the the head of the household, his wife decides to. Um, demonstrate Tartuffe's lechery um, by getting a husband to hide under the table and then <laughs> get Tartuffe to, you know, run his hands up her inside thigh. And it's the closest you get in 17th century comedy to having sex on stage. I've seen productions where it gets quite close. There's a lot of physical business going on, you know? This is mostly words. The action's in the words. Yeah. And is, is, is it performed? You said you saw a performance in 2017. I mean, is it performed regularly in France? It's one of the most, it is now one of the most performed plays in the canon of the Comédie Francaise I read recently. I don't know how right. often. Yeah, regularly performed. But it, uh, I think, as I said before, I think it's the most challenging, perhaps the most controversial. You don't get many belly laughs. <laughs> One, in fact, very few. You, there, there's contemporary critics that ask for the, the rire dans l'âme, you laugh in your soul, because it's very witty and the verbal fencing. And just that wonderful scene at the end of Act Four when Dubois, Mr. Wood, comes in, dressed very extravagantly, and says, we have to go. And, and uh, this is yet another interruption of us just trying to talk to Celia Ben. And I says, well, you know, why? We have to go. Well, why do we have to go? We have to, we have to leave now. And he keeps saying the same thing. And eventually he says, I've got a letter for you. And there's a lot of comic business. And of course he hasn't got the letter on him. And, and you know, Francis wants to beat him. And we're going right back to Plautus then, you know? But that's just a very small, what most of Moliere's plays are, are, are different. Can I just add one thing I didn't say, which is worth well, interesting. And Nigel, a friend of mine taught me this very recently. And that Selimen in 1666 was played by Armand Béjar, played by a woman. If you think of Shakespeare's plays, and 30, 40, 50 years before, all the female parts were played by boys or men. And, uh, and Charles II um, picked up this fashion, if you like, um, when he was in France during Cromwell's time. And when he came back, the Restoration 1660, which is just before, it was only in the Restoration that female actresses, actresses played female parts. So this is what avant-garde, the French were ahead in that, in that respect. Uh, women played parts um, much earlier in France than they did, than they did in, in, in England. Got um, a question from Ron, then Jamie, and then Brian. So, if, if Ron, if you could, if you could go first. Thanks very much, Peter. Just a, a facetious observation, really. Just whether Macron knows uh, Alsace's last speech quite as well as Act One, Scene One. <laughs> I wish he did. Actually, <laughs> I, I, I have to. I, I I kind of admire Macron. I I, I love I love the way he's um, you know he. Well, there are certain things I love about it. I think he's been a bit silly about the vaccines, but I, I, I think his current crusade against um, Islamism, I choose my word, is brave and right. Um, and there's a huge fuss at the moment in France. One of his ministers recently talked about the Islamo gauchismo the way that, you know, it's woke to me. So the universities and left wing universities uh, have, have been apologists for. Uh, uh, for, for Muslim terrorism, for example, and I think he's he's calling it out and he's taking it on and he's making change. I think that's brave because France, as you know, has suffered more from Islamist terrorism than, than we have, and it's been bad enough here. Yeah. But he's, I mean, Macron is um, the French, one of the things they like about him, he is an intellectual. He's a very clever man, had a classical education, he'd been very well versed. Um, in, but I was very impressed. Apparently this wasn't a setup. I mean, you must Google it, uh, Macron and Le Bizantin. It's brilliant. I mean, he does the first, uh, I don't know how many lines, you know, off that. Of course, he did meet his 
wife um, when she was his drama teacher, but as a former headmaster, I better not go into that. because. <laughs> yeah, moving on, moving on. You had to fire her. No, I'm, no th thank you, Sean. I was actually going to ask exactly the same question, only I was going to preface it with how very annoying of Macron to be <laughs> so clever. No, well, it is not. Um, irritating. <laughs> Indeed. Bri Brian, it's Brian, very you very irritating, but thank you. We've covered it. Brian, would you like to read your question out? Or? Well, I just I'd like to say, is, isn't it this play in the tradition of La Fontaine and La Bruyere that the court is corrupt and you're better off at staying at home and sort of the, the fables are all very pessimistic about human nature? Well, they are. I mean, if I, if I allow myself a, a, a rather simple general statement, the classical, neoclassical French writers, their subject is man. Uh, in general, human behaviour. La Fontaine's fables are all about human behaviour. They're very cynical, yes, you know, they, about the law system and so on, about human nature, which uh, as has so much trouble um, um, uh, accepting La Bruyere as well. La Bruyere's famous work is called Les Caractères, which is a bit like these portraits. In fact, the only bit of 17th century literature which I'm aware of in French, which talks about ordinary you know, peasants, because they were just, you know, they're excluded, is La Bruyere describing animals in a field, blackened faces scrubbing around, and then the end, the end, you realize that they're peasants working in the field. Um, it's, it, it, it's very, very interesting. So it, it, it's very much a, a social elite. And yeah, um, you had to be careful about dissing the court, of course, because, or Moliere did, because he, he relied on Louis XIV's support, and particularly his brother, uh, to uh, as patron. So you don't bite the hand that feeds you. So there's a there was a line there was a, a line to walk there, and and, and Molière uh, was brave. I think Tartuffe, obviously, he's he's making mock of religious bigotry, uh, and and just it's exactly the same as Islamism at the moment. If you attack Islamism some Muslims will charge you with attacking Islam, which is completely different, you know? Um, and then he, after Tartuffe had to be taken off, the Archbishop of Paris banned it. And then he wrote Don Juan, which begins with Don Juan, you know, seducing a woman in a convent and, <laughs> and betraying her. So, uh, you know, the religious um, community took against Moliere big time and tried to, do him down, and he only survived because he he had the support of the court. I don't know if I've answered your question. I probably went around it, but um, remind me of your question and see if I've answered it. No, I was just saying that that, that it's quite common this sort of um, misanthropy, you know, in terms of La, La Fontaine. And... It is, it is, yeah. And it, Brian, I've just recognised who you are. I'm sorry, <laughs> Brian. Did I teach you learn any Moliere? Um, uh, L'école des femmes. Ah, famous student of mine from Morden College School, Oxford. Nice to see you, Brian. Very good to see you. Yeah, I mean, um, I think there are some positive sides of, um, of humanity which appear in, in uh, these writers. Um, I mean, Moliere's got a sense of humour, which I think is just about the most important human uh, quality. So I, I would perhaps leave with that thought. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Brian. Andy, Andy Barsby? Yeah, just to... Quick question. At the time, would Moliere have been known about in England in the same way that Shakespeare would have been known about in France? It's a very good question, and I don't think I'm going to be able to answer you, uh, Diana. That's a, I, I'll have to look at that. Um, certainly the, the French view of Shakespeare, they regard him, historically, they've regarded Shakespeare with awe and horror. Because... <laughs> the um, Shakespeare plays um, work to a very different aesthetic. I won't go too far on this because I'll be talking about this when I get on to Racine and Britannicus next time, which is, is chalk and cheese. Racine and Shakespeare are just at different ends of the spectrum. And Racine traditionally has not crossed the channel very well. Um, Voltaire was, um, for example, was a great fan of Shakespeare, but he did regard him as barbaric because of the physical business on stage. And Voltaire was a great lover of French neoclassical tragedy. In fact, 
he wrote quite a lot of bad tragedies himself, which is not what people read these days. Um, Moliere, did, was he known in England? I actually don't know, Andy, except that Charles II spent several years in Paris before coming back for the Restoration 1660. May have overlapped with, um, I mean, Moliere got back to Paris from his provin provincial touring in 1658, so they may, um, they may have overlapped, but his first big breakthrough was, I suppose it was 1658, because he's ridiculous, and 1662 was L'Ecole des Femmes, um, and so he may have, he, you know, maybe Charles II, um, he certainly brought French fashions over to England, but I don't know enough to answer you with any confidence. That's, we're probably running out of time. I thought it was interesting in your <laughs> intro, Peter, when you said um, that the, the English are slightly embarrassed to say, well, they wouldn't say that they were intellectuals, and yet in France it's, it's, um, it's com it's more it's more acceptable. Why why do you think that is? Why are we so well, embarrassed we, about that? Cultural traditions. I um, mean, it's not mm. it's not British, is it? To be clever, no. it is French to be clever. I mean, it, it, you know, they like they they acknowledge it. And they, literally, you say, you you can say. I've heard someone say, you know, what je suis intellectuel. <laughs> I'm an intellectual. <laughs> can you imagine saying that at a dinner party? No. You know, I mean, try it sometime. Um, <clears throat> And, and the French, you know, even now, I think Macron has, uh, has um, extended it. All, I think all French students now, if they do the baccalaureate, study four hours of philosophy a week. Very different. Wow. And, and I noticed, you know, you talk to a plumber or, um, you know, blue collar worker in France, uh, often it's been my experience that you, that they're often very articulate actually, in a way that, you know, and I'm, I'm now, generalizing probably in an unacceptable way but I've noticed that in my own experience that often uh, there's a pride not so obviously educated mm -hmm. are able and willing to have a conversation about politics about the economy well yeah they they value the mind you know the French in a way have never recovered from Descartes you know he said je pense Je pense donc je suis, I think, therefore I am. And the French are terribly rational. It's their great strength and their great weakness, you know, um, to be discussed. But I think we might run out of time there. Well, I, I get if, if we don't have any other questions, you've given a couple of plugs for the penultimate tutorial. We must all be there for uh, Racine and uh, Britannicus, which is a kind of, we're leaping from comedy to tragedy. Um, but that's on the 25th of March. So I really hope that we can see as many people as possible there. It follows um, the paradigm of my life, Sean, you know, that, uh, that trajectory. <laughs> well, it's a shame you're ending with tragedy. Maybe you should have ended with, with comedy and I, I, my, follow up. My, my, my challenge to myself is to interest an essentially British audience with Racine's tragedy, which, um, as I say, doesn't normally travel well. I think it's just incredible stuff so um, well i think if, if you can convince anyone this audience <laughs> we're, we're, we're right there with you um so so i really ha thank you all so much thank you peter thank you for our guests for for fantastic questions in the in the chat you'll see some uh links do do have a look at what we've got coming up apart mm -hmm. from peter's excellent tutorial there are there's lots of talks there